Uh, if you want to say your name and all that kind of stuff, then, then just just go up and just like, let it rip. It's a digital diary. All right, awesome. All right, hi. Um, my name is Anne Sherlock. Um, I live in Rhode Island, and I am a professional model. I teach kickboxing, and I do finance as well at home. And today, I want to share my story. Um, so I am a self-proclaimed perfectionist. I love to work and I love going non-stop. Go, 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 go. Because I constantly am trying to prove to myself that I am good enough. I am enough. Um, and today I really wanted to share a story about my journey. Um, it's not really something I talk about openly with my friends that often. I do go around to schools and I talk to school children um, about my struggles, but it's not really something I can get too candid about. Um, I don't ever really talk about how I truly felt during a really difficult time in my life and how I really overcame it. Um, so that is my story for today. Um, so let's go back a few years. I was 21 years old. Um, I had graduated high school when I was 17. I had left high school and I did homeschool for a bit and I wanted to pursue music. I was a singer for many, many years and singing was my absolute passion. It's all I wanted to do. I was obsessed with it and I wanted to be the best I could at it. I took lessons for years and years and years, and it was literally my whole life. Um, I didn't really have any friends. <laughs> uh, I struggled making friends in high school, and I finally left when I got completely sick of high school. I left, and I met, went to New York City, and I pursued music, and I auditioned. And I somehow got lucky enough to start singing in a recording studio uh, with a few other girls and we were going to do a girl group. Um, we were this close to starting a record deal. Um, and then I realized that the music industry wasn't everything I wanted it to be. It wasn't everything it cracked up to be. Um, I was 17 years old in a big city and I felt very alone there. Um, it was a very adult world and I was still very much so a kid. So um, I was expected to be sexy and exotic and mysterious and I was still just a girl who was still stuck mentally in high school maybe. Um, so I left, I didn't end up signing that record deal and I stopped singing. I quit completely because I was so turned off from the, you know, the sexy industry and they wanted to me to be a certain image, and I wasn't that image. I was a little chubby, and I was all about the music. Um, they wanted to hire me a personal trainer and get me down to a certain size so I would fit a mold, and I didn't want to do that, so I left. And after that, um, I spent a few years trying to find my way. I started modeling. Um, there was a lot of pressure me for me to lose weight. I was still chubby, quote unquote, um, but nonetheless I tried modeling. I liked it for the most part. I did not like the pressure to have to lose weight. Um, and for a while I just tried to figure my way around things and do modeling on the side. Um, and that worked out for me well for a little while. I didn't really listen to photographers when they told me I need to lose weight because I said, hey, I'm 20, I want to try to have fun with my life, I want to go out to eat with friends. I finally made friends, by the way. It was not easy, but I somehow made friends um, along the way, and I wanted to live my life at age 20. Um, and I remember, uh, yeah, after that, age 21 was the year my life changed. Um, I remember that I was struggling pretty hard with body image that year. That was the first year I really remember my body image took a downward spiral. Um, I was struggling hardcore with binge eating. Um, I was struggling with a lot of anxiety and depression. Anxiety is something that runs very deeply in my family, depression as well. Um, all the friends I had when I was 21, I lost. Um, I struggled so hard with binge eating that I ended up 
ending up in rehab. Um, that was the year as well I attempted suicide for the second time and I was stuck in rehab. My friends left because they didn't want to be friends with the girl who was in rehab. It was not cool. Um, I had a lot of life stuff going on that led me to that path. Um, so that was the year I really started to struggle with my body. I had gained a lot of weight from binge eating um, and purging and that was the first time that my parents introduced me to a personal trainer. They thought that, hey, you know, we know you're struggling with your weight, so why don't we get a personal trainer involved? <laughs> um, maybe not the best decision for someone who struggled with disordered eating, but they meant well deep down. So I met my, still one of my best friends, my trainer at the time, um, one of the coolest guys I know, and he took one look at me and said, you have to be the most uncoordinated human I have ever met. And he was right. I had the coordination of giraffe and nonetheless, he started working with me, um, not on helping me lose weight. He saw a lot deeper into me than a lot of other people saw. He wanted to help me get strong. Um, and that's actually how I fell in love with weightlifting. I'll get into that later. but. He started working with me and slowly I did lose weight. Um, not That wasn't really his goal for me. Was it my goal for me? Yes. But we ended up getting me into weightlifting and I fell in love with it. Um, also that year I met a boy. You know how these stories go. Um, I met a guy and I fell madly in love with him. Um, absolutely in love with him. And um, I decided that I wanted to do whatever it took for him to like me and accept me because I did not like or accept myself. Um, I despise myself still and I was still really struggling, you know, with depression and anxiety and I thought, hey, maybe this guy is going to cure me. Meaning he seemed like such a pure soul and someone who was perfect in my eyes and I said, I'm going to be perfect for him too because... I saw myself as someone who was very flawed and I was so afraid to tell him about myself and the fact that I'd been to rehab and I tried to commit suicide. Um, so I began this quest to make this boy like me as much as I liked him. Um, and you know, for a while we, we started dating, it was great, and I worked so hard at trying to be perfect for him and perfect in general. And I was really, you know, starting to struggle with some pretty bad obsessive compulsive tendencies and perfectionism. Um, I was still working for my trainer, so, you know, uh, my body was in an okay place, but I still was feeling a little crappy about myself. Um, the later on our relationship got, um, things started going downhill a bit. I started binge eating again, and I started gaining weight again. And I think my trainer saw this, and he never really made any comments about my weight. He was a really, really cool guy. And he said, you know what, we're going to keep getting you into strength uh, lifting workouts. Um, but something in me kind of snapped. I said, I don't want to do any of this anymore. So I stopped lifting for a bit, and I started dedicating even more time trying to be perfect for this person, for this guy. Um, and one day, you know, we were on vacation and he decided to tell me that, um, he wasn't happy with me and that he wasn't really feeling our relationship. And I remember th that exact second to a T was the moment my eating disorder started, um, my anorexia. I decided, oh, you know, if, if he doesn't love me and if he doesn't like me, I'm going to make him love me. <laughs> the perfectionist in me told me, you're gonna make him love you, which sounds so crazy, but I promise it gets better. Um, so after that moment, I literally went hardcore. I said to myself, you know, you have gained weight, so that's probably it. That's probably why he doesn't like you. So that became my new obsession. I said, I'm gonna lose all the weight I'd gained from binge eating again, and he's gonna maybe like me again. That was my low self-esteem talking. You guys are probably thinking, you're absolutely crazy, Anne. If, if a guy says, I don't like you, you should have said, screw you, and left. But no, low self-esteem Anne said, no, I'm going to make this person love me because he was someone I wanted to literally spend the rest of my life with in my mind. 
So that became my quest to get the perfect body. And that began my real issue with body dysmorphia. Um, I started up with my trainer again. I told him, hey, I really need to lose weight. And he was probably like, what the heck? You just stopped training and now you want to train again and you're acting all crazy. Bless your soul, Matt. You're the best. But uh, I started training. I said, I'm going to eat only clean foods. And I became completely obsessed. Um, I started going to the gym once a day, twice a day, three times a day. Um, I started counting my calories to a T and weighing everything I ate. Um, I started just doing some really extreme things that were completely unhealthy. And I became um, completely addicted to the feeling of power it gave me. Eating disorders give you the illusion that you are in control, you are in power. And since I didn't have control or power over my relationship with this guy, I decided that I wanted to have control over something and that something was going to be my body and my food. So I just completely went overboard. Um, my whole life became my workouts and my food. I was spending hours and hours in the gym each day and I started limiting foods, food groups, total food groups. Um, it just became my whole entire life. and. Sure, did I start losing weight? Yeah, you bet. And were people noticing and complimenting me? Absolutely, they said, you look great, Anne, you look wonderful. And you know, deep down, I was starting to feel a little gross. That's what's gonna happen when you do a lot of extreme things to your body at once. Your body does not like it. So mine did not like it very much. I was not feeling very good. Um, and did my boyfriend like me any more, any less? No. No, he did not. In fact, he was he started getting repulsed by me. Um, I dropped a lot of weight in a very short amount of time, which is really not good for your body. Um, and I started getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Um, my mental state started getting worse and worse and worse. And what once was just a quest to be perfect and have the perfect body began a very unhealthy um, lifestyle and mindset. Um, my best friend became my eating disorder. I literally could not go a second, a second in the day without it telling me something in my head. Um, it had so many rules for me. I couldn't eat after a certain time. I could only chew gum. I could only do this and this and this. And soon enough, everyone did not want to be around me because I was so afraid of disobeying that voice in my head that it limited everything I could do. Um, I literally did not want to talk about anything unless it was food or exercise related. I avoided all social events because I couldn't handle being around food. I couldn't go out to restaurants. I couldn't go out on dates. I couldn't go to family functions. I skipped every holiday. Um, I remember crying on my 22nd birthday because my grandmother decided to try to feed me real food, normal food, which you should eat on your birthday, and I couldn't handle being around it. I couldn't be near it. So I started crying and I caused a scene. That was the reality of my life. I, sh I might have looked incredible or goals, but I felt like garbage. Um, and everyone around me was starting to get concerned, as they should be. Um, so my relationship eventually fizzled out and that caused things to get a little bit worse for me. Um, I no longer had that person in my life, so my eating disorder became took up even more space in my life. Um, at that point, I was really, really ill. My body weight dropped down to a place where it never should be. Um, I remember spending most of my 22nd and 23rd year um, literally not able to do very much. Um, there's a lot people don't really tell you about eating disorders, the un the ugly side effects of them. Um, and I'm not really afraid to tell you guys about that, um, because a lot of people don't like talking about it, but I started growing hair like little peach fuzz. Um, my parents didn't want to hug me anymore. They were too afraid to touch me because they could feel every bone in my body. I, I looked 
just, I had yellow skin, um, my hair all fell out. I had literally bald spots um, in the back of my head. And I was, I had bed sores because I couldn't really get out of bed very often without passing out. Um, I was passing out everywhere. And, you know, people see this beautiful image of someone who's slim and, you know, they look amazing. They're exercising their butts off, but they don't really see what's really inside. And I, at that point, I think my brain function got so low that there's a lot I don't really remember um, about the 23rd, 22nd year of my life. My mom has to clue me in a lot because I spent most of it hiding in a room, um, crying all the time, in and out of hospitals. Um, and it finally got to the point where um, one day I just remember having a meltdown, um, a complete mental breakdown because um, I think I had run out of chewing gum. That was my food at the time, chewing gum. And I just completely, something in me broke down. So my mom finally, she said, you know what, we're gonna go to the hospital and you're gonna stay there for a while. Um, which ended up being the best thing I've ever done. Um, so I remember us going to the hospital and you know, the doctors immediately saw me at once. They took one look at me and said, you're coming with us to the psych ward. Um, so I stayed there for a little bit and they told me that I was two weeks away from cardiac arrest. Um, my organs were all failing. That is the ugly truth about eating disorders not many people talk about. Um, all of my organs were failing. Um, I, like I said, there's not much I remember about that time period. My mom literally clued me in a lot. I just remember like little like memory blurbs because my brain function was so low. Um, but one night when I was in the hospital, um, that was, I just remember this one night being the night that I finally said, do I want to die like this at age 23? Then I was like, hell no, I do not want to die like this. I was in so much pain. That's, that's what I really remember. Um, I just, I couldn't die like this. My own sisters wouldn't talk to me. They were too afraid to look at me. Um, they were already treating me like I was going to die. Um, I'm pretty sure they're getting ready to say goodbye, honestly. Um, and that was the hardest thing to see. Um, so that was the night I decided I wanted to fight and fight like hell to beat this disorder. Um, so I eventually, um, you know, I told the doctors that I'm gonna fight and that was it for me. That The light bulb switched on and I decided I was gonna fight this disorder. Um, I was gonna take control back because I had lost all control of this disorder. Um, it started off as baby steps, you know, stabilizing my vitals because that was most important. And I started um, working with a team to help me with my weight, um, managing my weight and getting back to a stable and healthy place. Um, I started working with a dietitian, um, with psychiatrists, psychologists, um, an eating disorder therapist. Yes, they have those. They're wonderful. Um, and it was hard as hell, I am not gonna lie to you. It had to be the hardest fight I've ever given. Um, I would not wish an eating disorder on my own worst enemy, if I'm gonna be honest. Um, every single second of your day is a mental game. One side of your brain is telling you one thing and the other is telling you the complete opposite. You are constantly fighting logic versus that eating disorder voice in your head. And I had to choose every single second of every day which one I was gonna listen to. Um, so, that fight was really tough. It ha It's taken years, it really has. Um, but, you know, with time, working really hard and ignoring those voices in my head, um, and finally coming to a place where I could actually, you know, walk around, I could work out again, which the doctors did not advise, just putting that out there. Um, I wanted to return and work with my trainer again, and this time I said, I'm gonna get strong. I want to start lifting weights. I don't want to lose weight. You know, that I had to switch that voice off in my head and I said, I need to eat in order to be strong. And my coach said, right on in. We're going to do this. We're going to get you really strong. <laughs> so that became my quest and I really fell in love with weightlifting again. And my coach, Matt, who I still work with today, who has seen me at my absolute worst, 
He said, we're gonna get you really strong and you're gonna check in with me every day. We're gonna see how much you're eating every single day. I'm gonna weigh you every day. If you, don't, if you get down past a certain point, I'm not gonna work with you anymore. We had some rules. So that became my love for weightlifting and my journey on accepting myself, loving myself, and most importantly, helping other people with this disease. Um, I, that is my new mission. I want more than anything to help other people who, who struggle with body dysmorphia, eating disorders, um, not feeling very good in their skin and not loving who they are. Um, so I became involved with Project Heal Rhode Island, which is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we help give scholarships out to people who want to go receive private treatment for their eating disorders. Um, and they really gave me the incentive to start helping people. Um, once I started working with them, I felt comfortable enough to actually get back into modeling. I know, you're probably shaking your head and saying, what are you doing, girl? That is such a stupid idea for someone who struggles with body image and an eating disorder. But something in my voice said, no. You're going to work as a model, but you're going to do so as a healthy person. And I now am a professional model. Um, I turned once my biggest weakness, my weight, and the way I thought about myself into one of my strengths. Um, I made a pact with myself. If a photographer looks at me and says, you're not thin enough to work with me, I say, screw them. I don't want to work with them. Is it hard? Yes. But I have come to a place now, um, lots of work, lots of therapy, that I am comfortable. Um, I am labeled as a plus size model and I bear that proudly. Um, and that is my message. I want to help people realize that you are so much more than a number on a scale than you know a certain body fat percentage you are so much more than a face you know you are you deep inside you are incredible you have a light inside of you um, and that's been my mission ever since I want to help people um, realize how incredible they are and that they don't need to change themselves to fit into a mold or try to be perfect. That is still something I do work on, um, my perfectionism, but I've turned it into an advantage for myself. Um, I love to work really, really hard, but I, I am starting to realize that I need to take breaks sometimes and that's okay. And if that's, that's something I really want to leave off to people, that it's okay to not be okay and not be perfect. And I hope you realize that. So that's my message. And that is my story. And I hope what you can take from it is that you are perfect and unperfect as you are. You do not have to change a single damn thing about yourself. And you, you are you. And that's all who you should be. That was a blurb. <laughs>